is the planet warming, are humans largely responsible, and is it going to be bad? Uh, that has been solved. What, where that informs policy is in what we would call mitigation. That argues for not putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's something that isn't going to have an effect upon the Earth and the biosphere, everything that lives on the Earth, for uh, 30 to 50 years. That's about how long it takes for the Earth to respond to a climate, uh, a change in greenhouse forcing, as they call it. In other words, if we were to stop burning carbon, you know, burning fossil fuels or uh, emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere now, the planet would continue to warm for 30 to 50 years, or even 100 years. And the small changes that we've seen now, which are, I think, tolerable, although scary, will inevitably become larger. What we have in our control now is to prevent them, I think, from being catastrophic. Okay? However, you, we should understand that what we're talking about there is the planet we're going to ha hand to our children and grandchildren, not something that we're going to affect t uh, today or tomorrow. The science needs to go in global warming right now is towards looking at adaptation. That's very different. The climate will change. Sea levels will rise. We don't know how much or how fast. Uh, agriculture will be affected. Water availability in the southwest and in the, north, in the Northwest, believe it or not, the Pacific Northwest is going to be affected by this. And the science isn't all there in knowing exactly how, how specific regions are going to be affected. So in terms of science policy, I think that's where climate research ought to go. The science is a bipartisan problem, okay? And to, to assume that just because perhaps a different president or a different party comes into power in the next election, censorship is going to go away is not really a good assumption. This time in the election cycle in the year 2000, it was actually in August, so just when the, the Bush-Gore election campaign was going into its final you know, sprint for election day, uh, Jim Hansen published a paper with some colleagues in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I think in a lot of ways, and it would buy us a little room or a little time perhaps to deal with the incredibly difficult energy issues associated with getting rid of the fossil fuels or the greenhouse gases from those. Well, the scientific mainstream went ballistic over this. Uh, Mr. Gore also went ballistic over it. And what Jim Hansen says to me, and I didn't even get this into the book, I, I, I couldn't believe that he didn't tell me this as I was writing the book with him. Um, he said that the hardest time he has ever had getting a press release out related to a science paper was with that particular press release. I've heard from a few people at NASA that de facto NASA kind of reports to the vice president. And a lot of this has to do with Mr. Gore's interest in climate and the fact that uh, NASA is, is by far the leading organization in the world doing climate research. Scientists should speak the truth as they see it. And this therefore, Jim has come up with two proposals. These, these, you know, we were asked to imagine uh, restructuring U.S. science policy. Two proposals related to censorship. The first would be that testimony to Congress by government scientists not be filtered by, by uh, bureaucrats or whomever in the, uh, in the executive branch. Uh, this is um, a balance of power issue as well. This is a, you know, imperial presidency or um, that sort of an issue. Uh, Congress allegedly controls the purse strings and sets the priorities for these agencies. They should be getting honest feedback on the results. In Jim, Jim's testimony is usually actually uh, edited by people from the Office of Management and Budget who are supposedly finding out whether it's going to uh, correspond to the budget appropriately. But it's funny how what comes back is more amplification of the uncertainty of uh, climate science and minimization of the dangers it poses. Now the second proposal that he uh, suggests is that, um, you know, at the tops of these agencies in the public affairs departments, you always have political appointees. Uh, in my book, at the end, I, in the acknowledgments, I talk about how bad I feel about the fact that it reflects badly upon NASA. Because almost everybody I interviewed in NASA was an inspiring person to meet. They were honest, they were capable, they were intelligent, 
They were trying to do their best jobs. Most of them, by the way, were dying for the chance to tell me the truth about what had been going on. And I don't hold it back that they didn't come out to the public the way Jim Hansen did. Many of them were in just much more difficult situations than he was. Um, anyway, um, Jim now refers to these as offices of propaganda. Whenever there's a new administration that comes in, you just have a whole new set of political functionaries and ideologues who come in at the top and start manipulating uh, press releases. And the way they're released, it's very sophisticated how it's done. Uh, they should be replaced by civil servants who have been working at these agencies for years and years and can provide continuity and will also just uh, speak for the scientists appropriately. So those are two specific suggestions. Beautiful, although it's, it's sad at the same time, but I like that in the background. And I want to say that as far as climate science is concerned, uh, NASA holds a special place, as I said, because it is the leading organization for this in the world. And pardon me for being blunt, but if I imagine a sane science policy at NASA regarding climate science a year or two from now, I'm afraid I must say that uh, Michael Griffin, the present administrator of NASA, is not there. He's not in the picture. Um, it is pretty clear. Um, you know, there was an Inspector General's report on the censorship issues that formed the kind of beginning part of my book uh, that came out about a month ago. And for someone like me who just looked at all the details for more than a year, who said what, when, so on and so forth, trying to find out what actually happened, uh, this is pretty much the nail on the coffin for me. I would say, I, I'm not going to say beyond a shadow of a doubt, but the preponderance of evidence certainly shows that Michael Griffin actually directed the censorship of Jim Hansen, the most bare-knuckled attempt at muzzling any scientist in the federal government that I can think of. Uh, th that would be David Mould, who is still the head of public affairs there, who formerly worked for the Southern Company, which is the second largest coal-burning utility consortium in the United States, and therefore the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide. And uh, he's just one of many, of course, throughout the agency. Uh, Mr. Griffin has caused a brain drain of scientists at headquarters. Uh, his first uh, science administrator was a woman named Mary Cleave, who was a very nice person, but she really wasn't a scientist. And actually, she did um, allow the censorship to happen, participated with it a in it a little bit, as did her assistant. Mr. Griffin then hired an extremely good planetary scientist named Alan Stern, who just resigned in frustration a few months ago, just after a year of, uh, uh, after less than a year of being there. Um, uh, Mr. Griffin seems to think, he, he, the, the things he says about scientists are unbelievable. He seems to think of them as children. He actually said to me, I have it on tape, that they need adult supervision. And uh, he is remarkably misinformed about the work of his own climate scientists. Effectively, he's a climate He's a climate, he's a climate, uh, a global warming denier. I mean, he has, the, he, this is not the appropriate person to be leading the largest effort in climate science in the world. Um, <laughs> secretly, he um, removed the uh, mission, and probably illegally, he removed the uh, primary mission statement of the agency uh, from its mission statement uh, right around the time that the censorship was taking place and the time that he was also secretly cutting the budget to earth science. The, uh, it had said to understand and protect the home planet was one of NASA's, uh, what is, was its, fir its main, its first line of its mission statement. That was removed. The engineers, there's always a kind of a tension at NASA between the people who like to build the big, huge gizmos and the people who like to do the science. And what he did was he cut the research and analysis budget at the agency. That's where the science gets done. That's where you can get all the data you want from the satellites studying the polar ice sheets, but if you can't think about it and analyze it, what good does it do? The other, the heartbreaking thing about it is that this, this so-called RNA funding goes out to, to uh, young professors at universities. It goes out to fellowships for uh, graduate students or, uh, in order to get into the field. And effectively what it's doing is killing the baby in, in the crib. It's, it's uh, preventing the next generation of scientists from developing. So that's an extremely important thing to change. All domestic programs in the United States, the excuse has been that we can't afford them because uh, there's no money because of the Iraq war. So I just have to say, obviously, one of the best things you could do for science in this country, or many other things, is end the Iraq War.